All right, so this video we're gonna look at electron configurations and how they connect back to ionization energy, atomic radius, and electron affinity. So we're gonna define each of these things and then we're gonna look at how they apply or how maybe they relate to where an electron is and how that may correspond back to the energy of uh, needed to remove an electron or add an electron or how that relates to the size of an atom. So let's first start by talking about a radius and how that corresponds back to our electron cloud and reminding ourselves that when we're talking about an atomic radius, we're thinking of the size of an atom and it's based upon where our electrons are. So how many electrons we have is going to influence what the size of our atom is going to be, where those electrons are occupied, as well as the interaction between the protons in our nucleus to our electrons. So for example, if we were to look at something like hydrogen versus something like lithium and why their sizes may be different again our hydrogen we have one proton and then we have this one neutron one electron occupying the 1s subshell whereas we look at lithium lithium we have a plus three charge but now we have again our 1s and now we also have this 2s orbital where we have two electrons in the 1s and then one electron in the 2s and we see because of the fact that our n equals 2 here versus our n equals 1 in our valence shell we would see that uh, our lithium atoms are going to occupy uh, a, a larger volume and that has everything to do with the electron cloud where these electrons are and how that corresponds back to the size of them now we also need to think well these are corresponding to similar atoms and the fact that they're in the same uh, group there they would all have one valence electron uh, and we'd see the same would be true for something like sodium or potassium as we go down group one our size is going to get larger simply because we are occupying a larger n value shell now we also need to think about well how are these electrons being attracted to the nucleus uh, and we're going to talk about in class how this corresponds back to our effective nuclear charge. So as we uh, think about, well, lithium is going to have a larger size than hydrogen, but maybe if we compare that maybe to beryllium. Beryllium also has, if we think about our nucleus as a plus four charge, we have some electrons in the 1s, and we also have some electrons in the 2s. Now in this case, we have two electrons in the 1s, and now we also have two electrons in the 2s. Well, our effective nuclear charge for lithium, our valence electrons is plus one. We have these two electrons that are shielding, uh, the, the core electrons are shielding the uh, outermost electrons, our valence electrons from the charge of the nucleus. Here, our effective nuclear charge is plus two for beryllium. Now, even though we have more electrons, again here, we have more electrons than we would see when we compare lithium versus beryllium. But because our effective nuclear charge is larger, we would see these electrons are going to get pulled in or attracted. That electron cloud is going to get condensed a little bit more when we would have beryllium versus lithium because they're occupying the same shell number. They're both in the 2s or the n equals 2 shell. And so what we would see here is that our beryllium is actually going to be a smaller atom than lithium, even though it has more electrons, because the effective nuclear charge is greater for those valence electrons for beryllium, and so they're going to get pulled in and make that size get smaller. And so kind of the trends that we would see is we have an increased radius as we go down a group in the periodic table. So that would be like hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, as we go down that group, we're going to get to a larger atom size. And that has everything to do with that we're occupying larger shells, right? We're occupying a 2s versus a 1s in our valence shell. Whereas if we're looking at within a, uh, a period, what we'll see here, right? Uh, as we're going across a row, we're going to decrease in the radius as we go left to right uh, on within a period 
So that's why we'd say sodium, or sorry, lithium is a larger size than beryllium. Boron's gonna be smaller than beryllium. Then we get to carbon. Carbon's even smaller than boron, and nitrogen's even smaller than carbon, and oxygen's even smaller uh, than nitrogen. Uh, and so we'd see it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that has everything to do with the fact that we have a greater and greater, greater effective nuclear charge. So we, this, that's an important factor when we're considering this, the size of our atoms here. Now the, the next thing that we want to discuss and just kind of an overview here is ionization energy. So ionization energy is the potential energy needed to be added to an atom. So we'll notice we're always going to add energy to remove an electron from an isolated atom. So if we were going to maybe express this, we could say I have atom X, whatever it would be, in the gaseous state. I'm going to take an electron away from that and produce a positively charged um, ion here. So we would say here the change in potential energy for our system, for which would be the electrons and the protons in our atom, is going to be equal to our ionization energy. So we'd see it takes some amount of energy to pull that electron out. So that would be, for example, if we're going to look at something like our lithium atom here, we can go from lithium to an electron plus Li plus, and we've removed that electron, and we'd say here our ionization energy is 520 kilojoules per mole, right? It's the amount of energy needed. It's positive, meaning we have to add it. Energy has to be added. We have to pull that electron away from the, the nucleus. And so we think, well, if we're pulling that electron from its attraction to the protons in the nucleus, that's going to take some energy as we pull that out. Now, what's going to influence the magnitude of this, uh, this energy? We'll see here that the greater the attraction to the nucleus for the electron, the larger our ionization energy. So the more that electron is being attracted to the nucleus, the larger the ionization energy that we're going to see uh, for when we remove that electron. So here we have just a couple examples of a couple uh, different elements. We have lithium and beryllium, and we have these successive ionization energies. And let's make a couple observations here. Observation number one is that the ionization energy for lithium is less than the ionization energy for beryllium. Now, what does that mean? What that means is it's easier to remove an electron from lithium than it is to remove an electron from beryllium. And we can connect that back to uh, this idea that we would see here with regards to effective nuclear charge. So here we can see that our effective nuclear charge is plus one for that electron that I'm gonna pull away, whereas our effective nuclear charge is plus two for our beryllium atom. Now that means that it's going to be or that that electron in our beryllium atom is more attracted to the nucleus because it feels an effect a greater effective uh, or experiences a greater effective nuclear charge and so we, what we can make an observation here is that the larger the effective nuclear charge the higher our ionization energy more energy needed to remove that electron now what we don't have here is we don't have any comparisons of maybe lithium versus sodium versus potassium or as we go down a, a group. This is again for a period, okay? We could also see that if there's two things that affect the way that our electrons are attracted to the nucleus. One of them is our effective nuclear charge, the magnitude of the charge that it feels, and the other one is the distance. And here we could also see the larger the atomic radius, so maybe if we compare lithium versus sodium versus potassium, uh, potassium is going to have a larger atomic radius than sodium uh, versus lithium. We could also see here that would mean it's easier to remove that electron, so that electron's not as greatly attracted to the nucleus, and that would mean that we would have a lower ionization energy. So these two factors that we need to consider, and that's within a group here. So we need to consider a group versus a period when we're comparing these uh, different ionization energies. The other, the second observation that we can make here is that as we go from one to the next, 
first ionization energy is removing our first electron. Our second ionization energy is moving the second electron. The third ionization energy is moving the third electron. Is that our successive ionization energy values always increase? And that's just because as we go from one to the next, that just means it's going to be harder to remove maybe the second electron versus the first electron, etc. And that's because now as we've removed those electrons, we now have less electrons that are being attracted to the nucleus and that effective nuclear charge basically gets stronger and it holds those electrons in. The other observation that we can make is that this first to second for lithium is huge, whereas the first to second change is not really that big, it's about double. But then as we go from the second to the third, it's almost 10 times larger. And so we could also make this observation is that when an electron is removed from what was our core electrons, or we could also think of a noble gas electron configuration, what we'll observe is that we are gonna get a huge increase in our ionization energy value that we would see. So here we have our first one, our lithium. Our lithium is 1s2, 2s1. So if I remove, if I think here, I remove that first ion, uh, ionization energy corresponds to that first electron being removed. That second one, now I'm going to be removing an electron from my core electrons or this these more stable, lower, closer to the energy closer to the nucleus electrons. Whereas I go ahead and I look at beryllium, 1s2, 2s2, we have two valence electrons. So I remove my first electron, take some energy. I remove my second electron and it takes a little bit more energy. Now I no longer have any valence electrons. And I'm gonna go ahead and I go to my third electron. And now as I look at removing my third electron, we see this huge jump in our, our ionization energy. And that's because we're going to be removing an electron from the core. So that's something we notice is we're removing it from either a, a noble gas electron configuration or we start to remove electrons from the core. Uh, we're, we're just gonna get this huge jump. Now this is another um, data point that supports the idea that beryllium is gonna make a plus two charge. It's only going to lose its valence electrons because to make a plus three charge, it's gonna take a lot of energy to remove that third electron. And so we'll see that's important in connecting this idea of why certain atoms make specific <clears throat> ion charges when they uh, make ions. Okay, so those are some observations that we have the ability to make about our ionization energies. And again, we're gonna just go through and talk through some applications of these uh, in class. But our, first, our, sec our third one here is electron affinity. Our electron affinity is a potential energy change, again, associated with the addition of an electron to a gaseous atom in its ground state. So again, I could have some element X. To that, I'm gonna add an electron, and now I get a negatively charged uh, atom, which is our ion here. That change in potential energy that occurs when this reaction happens would be our electron affinity. And a couple of things to note here is that our electron affinity, it could be like almost zero, or it could be negative, or if we were looking at maybe some a different period, they could also be positive. So note this is not always a positive value, it's not always a negative value. It's a change in potential energy that we'd see for the removal, or excuse me, the addition of an electron here. Now this would be, for example, uh, maybe if we look at our chlorine atom, this would be our chlorine atom adding an electron to give us the Cl minus ion. And our change in potential energy here, which is our electron affinity, would be negative 349 kilojoules per mole for our chlorine atom. And we see here, this is telling us the energy needed to add an electron to the nucleus. And kind of our guiding principle that we can look at like we saw with ionization energy is the more greatly the added electron is attracted to the nucleus, what we'll see here, that's gonna give us the more negative the electron affinity is. So the, the more it's attracted to the nucleus, the, the more 
it's going to release energy, that's what a negative value would be, release energy as we form that attraction between that new electron and the nucleus. Now what's going to influence this? We can think, well it's gotta be something related to how close the electron can be and the charge of the nucleus that that electron would feel. So let's go ahead and fill in uh, our effective nuclear charge for our electrons in, in uh, our period three elements. So this can be plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, plus seven, plus eight. And then we think, okay, where will the added electron go and how will it be attracted to the nucleus? So for example, if I look at chlorine here, we have 3s2, 3p5. Our added electron is gonna go into the 3p, a 3p orbital. And what that means is that it's gonna be just as close to the nucleus as our other 3p electrons, and it's gonna be attracted to a plus seven charge. Now again, we compare that to sulfur, it's the same thing. We're gonna be adding it to the 3p orb, a 3p orbital. It's just as close to the nucleus as per se, on average, uh, the chlorine atom that we would see. But we can compare the difference between these, is that if we look here, our effective nuclear charge for chlorine is greater for that electron than the effective nuclear charge for the atom added to sulfur. And so because of that, we have a higher, excuse me, more negative, or stronger is what we could say, uh, electron affinity for that added electron. And that gives us the ability to understand why we would see this more negative value here. The more negative our electron affinity, the stronger the attraction of the electron to the nucleus that we've added. And so what we'd see here is this is basically the opposite that we would observe for our ionization energy. Our ionization energy is gonna become more and more and more positive because it takes more and more and more energy to remove that electron. Uh, whereas for a chlorine atom versus a sulfur atom, it takes we're gonna release more energy to add an electron to chlorine than sulfur, and that has everything to do again with the attractions between our uh, nucleus and that electron. But then if we maybe compare that to some things that have the same effective nuclear charge. So for example, in group 1A, all of these atoms have a plus one effective nuclear charge. So that would mean that they, uh, an added electron is going to feel the same effective or experience the same effective charge from the nucleus. So we could say, well, there's no, there's no relationship there between our effective nuclear charge and the magnitude of our electron affinity. But what we do notice is that now when we're adding these electrons to an, uh, maybe a rubidium atom versus a sodium atom, here what we'll see here is the uh, added electron goes in the next available spot, which would be the 5s orbital. Whereas if we compare that to sodium, our added electron goes in the 3s subshell. And what that means is that this electron gets to go closer to the nucleus. Well, if that electron has the ability to go closer to the nucleus, what does that mean for us with our electron affinity? That means we're gonna have a stronger attraction to the nucleus. Because we think there's basically two factors that influence the strength of the attractions. And this is our columbic attractions, right? Positive, negative charge attractions. The closer that the, the electron could get to the nucleus, the stronger the attraction, and also the greater the effective nuclear charge. The greater the charge that electron is being attracted to, the stronger the attraction. And so uh, we can see that we can summarize those attractions in distance and charge. And the greater the charge of our, our nucleus, the greater effective nuclear charge, the stronger the attractions. The closer that electron can get, the stronger the attractions. And so we can take those guiding principles and apply them to our ionization energy, our electron affinity, and we can also connect that to our atomic radius. So in class, we're gonna take these ideas and we're gonna unpack them a little bit more as we try and predict uh, the relative magnitudes of our electron affinity ionization energies, as well as connect that to our successive ionization energies and electron affinities.